Psalm 56. Amen. Well, that's, that's nothing. One time we were sitting around the table, and this was when I was pastoring on Bolivar, and my girls were little, and I burped, and, and I, I forget which one of my girls, but they looked at me and said, Brother Randy burped. <laughs> All right, Psalm uh, 56. <clears throat> and notice uh, the superscription on this, to the chief musician upon Jothnath Elam Re. Hokim, midst time of David, when the Philistines took him in Gath. <clears throat> All right, so guess what we're talking about here? The same exact situation that we did last time, when the Philistines took him in Gath, and, um, and he wrote this in relationship to that. But interestingly enough, this psalm is coming at everything from a completely different angle, even though it's the same circumstance. Do you know that you can be in one circumstance and be fighting with it from several different angles? <laughs> or, in, really in the case of Psalm 34, David wasn't fighting. He had the victory, didn't he? Well, from this angle, he's got problems. And this is the same exact circumstance. So I want you to know that it is that that uh, when you're, you know, that will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on me. That's the scripture. That means that if you if you keep your focus on the Lord, many times you'll be in the Psalm 34 portion of wherever you're whatever you're going through. If you if you're just looking at the problem, sometimes you'll slip into the Psalm 56 angle of it. You getting my point here? <clears throat> All right. Um, Psalm 34, it was about, you know, trusting the Lord at all times. Um, and then that means times when you're foolish or make mistakes. Uh, that's what it was about. This psalm is seen from the angle of the enemies. But now let me make this clear. The enemies here, he's not talking about Saul, King Saul, and he's not talking about the Philistines. He's talking about people that are saying stuff about him, that he was a rebel, that he was rebelling against Saul, that he was things that he, I'm sure, I'm sure there were things said he didn't even know about, but he knew that there were slanders, and that's really basically what this psalm is about. Um, in that situation. <clears throat> um, and his enemy here is, you, you could say his enemy is slander. His enemy is those who are spreading that kind of stuff. And so we start with verse 1. Be merciful unto me, O God, for man would swallow me up. He, fighting daily, oppresseth me. So I want you to see that while they're in the cave, David, say, David is saying, I will bless the Lord at all time. His praise will continually be in my mouth. Here he's saying, be merciful unto me, O God, for man would swallow me up. He fighting daily oppresseth me. And here this swallowing up, you know, Jonah was swallowed up by a whale and taken down into the depths. And what did Jesus liken that unto? The cross. <clears throat> so you could, you could almost say that Psalm 56 is the cross and Psalm 34 is the resurrection. Okay? And so here is this uh, swallowing up that's taking and this fighting daily and this oppressing of him. But what it is, is it's not Saul and the Philistines. It's all the things that people are saying about him that have no foundation of truth. Verse 2, mine enemy would daily swallow me up, for they are many that fight against me, O thou most high. When you see most high, you're talking about lamb upon the throne. You're talking about he who sits above all things, and that's the lamb of God. 
Um, but he's saying, there are many that fight against me. And so there's oppresseth me, and the word oppresseth is E-T-H. And so that, what that means is that they are continually oppressing him, um, that they are trying to swallow him up. They are fighting daily. Uh, they, uh, they fight against me, O thou most high. And here he turns to the Lord in a different spirit because when you're in resurrection, folks, it's like surfing and catching a wave. And you don't, thank you for that commentary. Uh, you don't, you know, on that surfboard, you don't even have to do anything, basically. I mean, you catch the right wave, you just stand there. And it carries you all the way into the shore. In resurrection, that's the way it is. And resurrection can be like a, a season you're going through because of a death that you pass through. Or it can be a season a church is going through where there's a period of death and a period of resurrection. And the resurrection can go for years and years. I mean, seven, you know, it can go for years of resurrection life based on however deep the death was. Um, and basically, it's like uh, the, the goose that laid the golden egg. You know, you can do no wrong. <clears throat> and so, on a, in a certain sense, it's, it's, easy to, to, it's easy to follow the Lord. And it's easy to serve the Lord. It is, and it's wonderful, and it's glorious, and everything else, but, but also isn't, isn't bearing about in our body the dying of the Lord Jesus also glorious? Yeah, and the question is, is it really? Because Paul said, we bear about in our bodies the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus might be made manifest also. And so... Um, but it requires a different kind of trust. Um, it's almost like a clinging because you don't have anywhere else to hold to. You know, it's, it's like a, um, well, it doesn't feel like a hook. It feels like, you know, it's all gonna slip out of your hand. It's like holding on to a greased rope and you're sliding down a little more and a little more and you're afraid you're going to let go, and yet, um, yeah, I've said this before, but I believe that the Lord is more greatly honored in faith that is holding on when it's not easy Amen. than when it's everything's glorious and you, oh, I've got faith for, you know. I mean, you see what I mean? I think he's more glorified because you're really with him. Whereas the other, you know, good feelings can, can keep you with the Lord. You know, if, if you just feel good all the time, you know. I don't know what that's like, but I bet it would be great, you know. But if you did, if you just felt good all the time, that, wouldn't that be wonderful? And wouldn't life be wonderful? And, you know, back in my early Christian days, I'd say, well, you know, who wants Jesus to come back? Everything's good. You know, I mean, I said that at one point in my early walk because miracles and blessings and everything was going on. I thought, you know, somebody said, man, I hope Jesus comes back today. And I said, why? Life's good. You know, <clears throat> folks, you know, we, our relationship should be based more on just wanting him than wanting what he gives and how good things can be. All right, so um, uh, in one of the translations that I looked up, the word mine enemies was translated those that lie or slander. <clears throat> and so you, you're gonna see this flowing all the way through here. <clears throat> uh, verse three, when I'm afraid, I will trust in thee. And I wrote, David does have fear, he does. Trust does not take it away. Isn't that funny? Because I was taught in the charismatic movement that you either, either have fear or faith. That that, that that was the contrast. Now, I don't see that in the Bible, but that's what it said. 
that you either have fear or faith, which didn't really, it did me good when I was in faith. But when I didn't have faith, then I must be in fear. You see what I'm saying? And it put me sort of in a flux and in a turmoil because then I thought, well, if I'm not walking in total victory at every given moment, something must be wrong with me. Okay? Uh, but I wrote, um, courage is in the face of fear. Courage, you know, be strong and of good courage. And it is in the face of fear. I mean, there is a fear connection to it. Being courageous is done by one who is trembling. That's what I, you know. It, and, it's, and it's possible to be standing for the Lord and be trembling. Amen? It's possible. <clears throat> you say, well, how do we know it? Just follow me around a few days and you'll, you'll know it. And then verse uh, 4, In God I will praise his word. In God I have put my trust. I will not fear what flesh can do unto me. And um, the, I noticed that he used that little phrase, in God, twice, or in union with God. In union with God. When in union with God, I will not be afraid. Because there is a certain release that comes because even when there's stuff, and, you know, again, I think there can be fear and faith at the same time. That's my opinion. But I, I believe that your faith is in union with him, and therefore you know ultimately it's going to be all right. Your fear can be, but I may lose my house in the process, or, you know, something. Something that we don't want to lose. My girlfriend or whatever whatever you know you know there's but ultimately I'm going to be okay and it's going to be fine you ever been there and so uh, and in those times you try to focus more on the reality of Christ because you know it'll carry you through with less soul stirring and soul upheavals going on on the inside of you uh, whatever flesh does to him and it will do stuff I wrote you can tell these are my notes whatever flesh does to him and I put in parentheses and it will do stuff it will not break his union folks whatever anybody does to you cannot break your union with Christ Neither height, nor depth, nor fear, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come. Paul said, I'm persuaded that nothing can separate me. He didn't say nothing can separate me from the love of God. He said nothing can separate me from the love of God that is in union with Christ Jesus. And we, if Jesus is raised up, if Jesus truly is sitting at the right hand of God right now, then you're in union because he sat down, meaning the work's done. If he's there, and now if he's not there, if he's still working to get up there, you better start worrying. But if he sat down, you were seated with him, and <clears throat> the work was settled. All right. Um, verse 5. Every day they distort my words. All their, all their thoughts are against me for evil. <clears throat> all right, so I started thinking about this. <clears throat> I, mean, I, mean, let's not, I mean, let's read it again. Every day they distort my words. All their thoughts are against me for evil. <clears throat> I started at one point, not recently, but at one point thinking what is David's problem? I mean there's so much of this. Do you understand what I'm saying? There's so much of this and yet God preserved this and put it in the heart of the word. If you want to know where the center of the Bible is open it up and it'll fall open at the Psalms. You know. Um, and he put this at the heart of the Psalms. <coughs> Why does David struggle through this? Why 
is he so gloriously with the Lord in some psalms and yet just oppressed at other times or at the same time, you know, gloriously with the Lord and yet if you meditate on that, I mean, I know, do you know what runaway thoughts are, anybody? <clears throat> you know, runaway thoughts can really run fast. And I learned this, I've learned this over years of, of experience, okay? Runaway thoughts are fast, so I can't afford to let them get too far. And I mean that. I'm not joking, and I'm not, I'm telling you, I have learned, <coughs> excuse me, I've learned, thank you, um, that when my thoughts start to break out and want to run, I shut them down because I know the end of that, and it's not good. It's, it'll set you back possibly weeks, months, or years, depending on how much you let them run. I don't let them run. I don't let them run to do evil. I don't let them get out, get out of the chute. They'll be in there, and they'll be jabbering, trying to get my attention. You know, it's kind of like somebody in prison. I've got them in a little cell in there, you know. Didn't it say bring every thought into captivity didn't it say that I got them in a little cell in there and they're trying to talk me into opening the door well don't, don't know well don't you know what they did to you well you should don't know well think about this what what would happen if you did this da, 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 da. and they're trying to they're trying to get the door open so they can run and I can you know I always say to people that's one luxury you can't afford you cannot afford to just let this stuff, it'll eat your lunch. The best thing to do is stay focused on Jesus. And it's not, and you know, if you let them run, oh my God, and somebody tells you to focus on Jesus, there ain't no hope at that moment. There is no hope because you're just like, oh, you know, you shouldn't have let them run. And I'm not being, you know, God, God loves you and you're okay and you're saved. Okay, so don't, you know, don't, you know, don't get into condemnation. I'm just saying, learn from that and don't let them out of the box. <clears throat> All right, so um, when in union, I, I will not be afraid. This is uh, this, this verse four. In God, I will praise his word. In God, I have put my trust. I will not fear what flesh sh shall do unto me. That's actually quoted over in Hebrews. Let's see if I got the verse here. Hebrews 13, 6. And the verse right in front of it is um, that he will never leave you or forsake you. I will not fear what flesh shall do unto me. He will never leave you or forsake you. And that, folks... If Jesus is simply here in this room beside me, somebody can drive a wedge between me and him. Okay? Yes. If Jesus is just your friend or your savior or anything else, somebody, including the enemy, can drive a wedge between you. But if you are one with him, you are a branch to the vine, you cannot be separated. And he will not allow separation because... Any attack then is not on you, it's on him because you're him, you're his branch. Yes, and those vitamins really help too. <laughs> Fortified. Anyway, sorry. Um, so, uh, so that scripture, whatever flesh shall do unto him, he will not be afraid because he knows the Lord will not leave him. You know, let me just give you my a personal circumstance. Man, I've been through a bunch of stuff in 40 years of serving the Lord. And I've been in some pretty down places. And I'm going to tell you, I've been down so low that my soul could find no solid ground it was like a you know the miry clay there's no bottom there's no stop nothing solid but because 
of the grace of God through the Holy Spirit who spent years developing my core, not my brain. You know, I told someone the other day, my, it all started in the brain, but it became part of my core. And then now the winds can blow and the birds that were all that stuff that was in my head can fly away and I can't remember and can't recall how it goes, my core is still unmoved. Amen. That doesn't just happen. That happens from years of going through stuff and then finding your place in the Lord and not being moved ultimately because when it all, you know, the idea is when it all passes, I'll still be here because I'll be one with the Lord and we will still be around. You know, all of the junk doesn't change the Lord. It doesn't change that you're in Christ. It doesn't change, you know, Jesus on the throne and you seated with him. Nothing changes that. Nothing does. But in circumstances, it may look like it's all changed, but nothing's changed. Are you looking in the heavens? Or are you looking at your circumstances? And you've heard that from me before, I bet. But it is the case. And, and um, so I would suggest that you practice this reality of union with Christ. Practice fighting thoughts and cast them down. Every thought that's contrary to the knowledge of God in Christ Jesus, that's contrary to the knowledge of God that says, I raised him from the dead and you were with him and you were one and I knew it. I still raised him. <laughs> you see what I mean? And you, and you fight. You, you grab those contrary thoughts and you throw them in jail. And you may be dismissed. I know you have to go, so there's no problem. And <clears throat> so I just want to get off of any sort of a religious basis that you might be in because we're sitting in a classroom and just say this reality of being in union with Christ has saved my life so many times I can't tell you and I'm so thankful that the Holy Spirit worked it in me because <coughs> I don't know how to work it in me I didn't then I don't know now if I knew I'd work it in you I mean I would I really would. I would help you. <laughs> but the best way I can help you is tell you the truth and hope that you have a heart for the Lord in these, these ways. What? I'm just teasing. <laughs> Couldn't resist. <clears throat> okay. Uh, let's see. Verse, uh, verse 6. They gather themselves together, but not in Christ. Oh, I'm sorry. They gather themselves together. They hide themselves, but not in Christ. They mark my steps when they wait for my soul. Interesting. David is the reason for their gathering, not the Lord. <laughs> I mean, they're, they're gathering they hide and they watch for something so that they can discredit. And they are, they are hunters, and he's a dove because verse, uh, uh, well, let's keep reading verse 7. Shall they escape by iniquity? Meaning, do they think by doing things wrong, by not having the fear of the Lord, that they're going to escape? If they find something wrong with me, do they think they're going to escape for using wrong me methods and means and stuff? And the answer is no. In thine anger, cast down the peoples, O God. Um, and and they, there is a pride. They think they're cunningly devised plots uh, are not going to just bring David down, but it's going to cause them to avoid punishment, when in fact that's the very thing that's going to bring their end. <clears throat> yes? Yes. 
Amen. And and he he despises that, you know, haughty spirit and all of that. <clears throat> in that verse, it says uh, in verse seven, it says, "In thine anger, cast down the peoples." And I thought, you know, they're like evil thoughts to God. You're supposed to cast down those thoughts, right? <laughs> they are like evil thoughts to Him. It's not meanness on His part. He's casting down evil thoughts. You know, I mean, we always misread God. He's casting down these evil people. No, he told us to cast down evil thoughts, and they're like evil thoughts to him, and so he cast them down. And then verse 8, thou, thou numbers my wanderings. Put thou my tears into thy bottle. Are they not in thy book? <clears throat> and uh, in verse 6, just, it's just as the enemy was marking David's outward steps. Remember it says that, they mark his steps. Notice that God numbers my wanderings. And uh, because God sees the heart and God sees the hidden actions. Folks, God sees the actions that we never do, that we could have done, that we would have done without the restraints of another life. God sees what isn't there and gets glory. Isn't that amazing? I mean, I love that about him. Um, and God sees the tears. And God sees the unjust treatment. But he also sees the lack of reviling. All is preserved eternally. It's preserved as evidence. It's preserved as eternal virtue. Yes. Wait, before you say that, it's preserved in a bottle and in a book. <laughs> Go ahead. Just how, when you were saying this is like the death and then 34 is like the resurrection? I, I can't even hear you, so I know no one else can. How uh, this song you were saying is like the death and then 34 is like the resurrection, and uh, that in death, there's not the there's not the surety of resurrection, so I was thinking about in that verse on wandering how um, like the scapegoat, which David was kind of like here. Um, in Hebrews eleven it says they wandered and she was not having chosen to not receive uh, deliverance that there might be a greater resurrection. And just how, you know, he was able to trust in a God above deliverance, above anything. You know, knowing that he was committing himself to the Most High and he was coming into something even greater than a sure deliverance from Saul, from Gad, you know, from the Philistines, that there was a spirit of the Lamb being released that was bottled up and honored. You know, like just there's something higher, and, and he was hiding in that place and wandering that spirit, fulfilling that heart. Well, I, I really. You know, I don't know how much anybody got out of the sharing I did on the scapegoat or any of that, but but God showed me, and you may remember if I bring it up, God showed me the true fulfillment of all of that, which wasn't a glorious picture of the priest laying hands on the lamb and everybody killing him, but, but that the priest laid hands on Jesus cast him out, rejected him. You understand? You, you see the difference. Yes. And we're all for the big religious show, and we all want to have glory. We want the Lord to get glory if we get glory. Yes. But this kind of glory is not glorious in the earth or to the eyes of... I'm telling you, most people don't even see it. They don't even know what you're going through. They don't even know the depths of the death that you died. But God does, and God knows the resurrection that's coming out of it, too. And for all of those, all of those that were hidden away, all of those that were secretly beaten and, and thrown and cast out and, and hurt by other people, it's not in vain. And uh, it, is, it is not you, either. It's not you. It's the scapegoat. It is 
being one with Jesus. And, and haven't you ever wondered about those scriptures in the New Testament that says that we're making up the lack of the sufferings of Christ? You know, haven't you ever wondered about that? Haven't you ever thought, well, what a strange way of saying this stuff? Folks, we're his body, and we carry that life. And this scapegoat thing, I believe... I believe, of whom the world is not worthy. The world doesn't get it. And Jesus was a criminal, and everybody that followed him ended up, Paul was in prison, prison, prison. You know why you go to prison, don't you? You're a criminal. The point being, the point being this. There is a place that a person can come to where you perceive the lamb in a different way than most people hear with their ears and think they perceive it. And you desire to be with him where he is. You desire to be after his kind. And it takes you to some ugly places but because you actually perceive something, not you were taught and tried to live it, you saw something from the Lord, you are able to be with the Lord in a, in a way that blesses him that you cannot put into words. I know, I know people right here in this church over the years who, who slaved and did great things for God and everything else and other people who were shut away and who are, you know, outcasts on a certain front and everything else and those people brought more glory to God than all of the great things that were being done okay but how many are going to see that well if you, you know and my thought all is what's the point of talking about it because most people aren't even going to get it you know I mean it's almost like I'm I'm not intentionally, but I'm putting them in a situation where they're going to try to live up to something or do something that they don't even have a clue about. But I have to preach Christ. I have to preach the cross. I have to preach the Lamb. And I have to preach the bride of the Lamb. I have to. Yes. Okay, now verse 9. When I cry unto thee, then shall mine enemies turn back. This I know, for God is for me. That little phrase right there. Anybody ever, what's that class that has the class in there? There's a spirit realm, sense realm. Or the class for the culturally deprived. Uh, spirit realm, sense realm has a, a, a one one class, I think, in there called God is for, me, for you or for me. You, if you don't have that down, you need to get that down, okay? You don't need to go any further until you know God's for you. And uh, David knew it, and David knew it early because this is the very beginning when he's starting a foundation. And what a great foundation to have in a man, a young man. What a great foundation to have in a young man named David or or Ben, or Jason, or young man named whatever, but have that foundation that God is, God is for me. Doggone it, what a blessed, blessed reality. And, and what did Paul say? You know, if God is for me, who can be against me? In other words, the one who died to justify, will he not freely forgive?
why you shared it today? Yeah. Well, I figure that one or two things is going on. <laughs> Either we plan this in advance <laughs> last night, or the Holy Spirit really knows where we're at right now and cares. And, and that, you know, the one who died to justify, will he not freely forgive us all things? It says, will he not freely give us all things, folks? In reality, the one who died to justify, will he not freely forgive us all things? Yes. If God be for us, who can be against us? And here's the deal. If God's for us, who cares who's against us? <laughs> I mean, if you really know God's Amen. for you, you know, you and him are... You know, that's a majority. Yes, Scott. Well, I, you know, I, I just think it's interesting, too, when you, when you remember that he's saying this from a cave that, where he's fleeing from Saul and from the Philistines. You know, I mean, that's, it's, he's, not, he's not in this great victorious time. No. He's actually in, fleeing for his life, as he says, if God before us, he could be yes. Amen. Amen. He's fleet. He, he is not at the height of his, the crown of his kingdom. He's not there. But folks, if you can't be a king in the cave, you're not going to be a king on the throne. And that's just a fact. Everything you do now counts. Everything you do, it's either, you know, you're either working, you know, you're, you start at, Point zero, and you're either working toward something by laying daily groundwork towards that, or you're doing things that's working against it. And you you can't reach God's end by going that the opposite direction. You can't do that. You know, we say, well, God will bring it about. I had a prophecy, or you know, God, all these, you know, you know, uh, no. You're laying the stones for what you're going to have to live in the rest of your life right now. They're just one little stone at a time, but you're laying it for, for the foundation that you live in. And I'll tell you what, you know, I'm going to tell you this. I spent my whole Christian life on these truths and did my best. And you can ask my wife and even my kids. I didn't sit around talking bad about people that attacked me when they were little. They didn't hear we. We didn't do that. They didn't even do it. We wouldn't even allow that. We would bless people and do that. So you'd think I'd sown enough where I would get just a, everybody to say nice things, except it doesn't say do unto others and they'll do it to you. It says do unto others as you would want them to do unto you. It doesn't say you'll necessarily get it back or certainly in this life. I mean, I spent my whole life. But you know what? I live in a house that is protected spiritually. A spiritual house that is protected that they don't have. They're, they don't have a covering. Do you know what it means to have a real covering from the Lord by the spiritual house you spent your life building that keeps you and protects you in the hundred pound hailstones that are falling from heaven or not knocking in your roof? It's not moved. And then, and that, you know, and you know, this, this will sound like any, just like that and this, it could be taken as boasting or whatever. I'm just telling you, there is something to this man, David, if you don't, you know, there's something to being a person like that, that says, I'm going to build the house I want to live in, you know. And you do it one stone at a time constantly. How you treat people, how you treat your husband, how you treat your wife, how you treat your kids, how you treat your boss, how you treat your, your, your leader in the church, how you treat, you know, on and on and on and on and on. And the Lord starts building in you his house and building you into his house. And, that, and yet we're, we're inside of him and he's our house. Um, and... And I'm just telling you that, that, I mean, the Lord speaks to me to this day regularly. And I just weep. I just, I just can't believe the things of his heart. And I don't deserve it. Um, but 
I am privileged. That's all I can say. I am so deeply privileged to, to be able not just to read scriptures and say them the way we would interpret them, but to actually hear what he's trying to tell us. And I know, and I know this, and I pray all the time, I know that I am still hard and hard-headed and blind and everything else. So I pray that he opens my eyes. But I am so thankful for the sense that I get that, you know, he's pleased to open his heart and be able to talk to somebody about things that he cares about. And I know he does with you too, but I'm just saying, I'm basing it all on this stuff right here. Uh, verse 10, in God will I praise his word. He doesn't just say, oh, I love the book. I love the book. You know? He says, in union with God, I praise his word. Because without that union, then I'm, it's just law. For you and me, he loved us more than words could say more than we could see. His death was not for pain, he while hanging on the tree. No, he died because he loves you and me. That's a point. Again, here at the, the, the begin, we're at the beginning, verse four and and on. He says, "In God, in this union," and now at the end of the the whole psalm, he's saying it again, and he's saying it because to David, union is everything from start to finish. It secures you everything. You didn't earn a dime of it, but it secures everything that's his becomes yours because you're one with him. Verse 11 again also, in God have I put my trust. Not just I put my trust, I trust in union, in this union. I will not be afraid, and this is just a repeat of another verse. Verse 12, thy vows are upon me, O God. I will render praises unto thee. Um, and notice he didn't say my vows, he said thy vows are upon me, you know. God vowed certain things to David about being king and being his chosen and about, and David praises God for his vows. Your vows are upon me. I mean, he's so not self-centered. <laughs> Praise God. And then finally, verse 13. For thou hast delivered my soul from death. That's past tense. Thou hast delivered my soul from death. Wilt thou not deliver my feet from falling? Because you know what? God saved you from something, but you can still fall. Will you not deliver my feet from falling that I may walk before God in the light, in the light of the living? Basically, he's saying, you did the eternal work. Thou hast delivered my soul from death. You did that. Will you now work it into my walk? <laughs> you did. It's settled in you. Now work it in me. Get it settled in me. And, that's, and then I'll just read my notes here and we'll, we'll finish. Um, it was David's soul that was headed toward meditating on the ways of death as to how to proceed. That was past tense. But now a question. Deliver my feet from falling. His walk. His heart is with God, but he makes mistakes in his walk. Amen? Don't you, don't you love Jesus? Yes, your heart is with God. Don't you figure you're going to make some mistakes? Yes. Some more? Yes. <laughs> so... His heart is with God, but he makes mistakes in his walk because he's not omniscient, Omno, all-knowing. David is not all-knowing, and neither are you, and neither am I. He wants to walk before God in the land of the living, in the light of the living, in the reality of the living. What is living 
in God's eyes, to walk according to God's reality in the heavens. So God does not always have to forgive him, straighten out circumstances, and deliver him. Father, we just ask you to uh, bring us into the counsel of being one of David's mighty men and let us hear from the man that you set up, David, from the man that you set up to establish the true kingdom on earth. Let us be one of the mighty men. Let us, let us be transformed, transformed from... Lord, discontented, in debt, grumbling and complaining and outcast. Let us be transformed. Let us hear from the man you set up to speak to us, to teach us the fear of the Lord. For we ask in Jesus' name, amen.